Welcome to the Grizzly Times podcast with Louisa Wilcox, a place devoted to all things grizzly, where we interview scientists, managers, Native Americans, and others about their perspectives and experience with bears and their ecosystems. This comes at a critical time in a complex debate about grizzly bears, with the recent restoration of endangered species safeguards for the Yellowstone bear, but a new proposal to strip protections for glaciers grizzlies, and when warming temperatures and development are transforming the bear's world. We hope that you find the information and views offered here useful as you shape your own conclusions. This is Louisa Wilcox with Grizzly Times, and I'm delighted to be here today with David Stalling, a hunter, angler, writer, activist, and former Force Recon Marine. David earned degrees in wildlife and journalism at the University of Montana, and he's devoted himself to protecting wildlife and wild places. His amazing writing can be found on his site, From the Wild Side, Wild Thoughts from an Untamed Heart. David, you grew up on the Connecticut coast where you got the bug for nature and fishing early, in part from your dad. Maybe you could share about your early experiences in nature. I'm sure, yeah. Um, You know, my dad was a pretty interesting guy. He he grew up during the Depression, and he did a lot of fishing and crabbing and um, and hunting mostly to help feed his family. And uh, he left high school. He quit high school when Pearl Harbor was bombed and and joined the Marine Corps. Um, Oh, and he was in some horrendous battles. He fought on Iwo Jima, Saipan, Tinney, and Okinawa. Um, And after the war, because he didn't have a high school degree, he he never really pursued his dreams. He actually wanted to get into wildlife and forestry and moved to Montana. So I kind of lived my dad's life. (laughs) And... uh, (laughs) um, but he was really incredibly knowledgeable, self-taught about wildlife. And we did a lot of hiking and camping and backpacking. And um, But what we spent most time doing is we grew up on the shore of Long Island Sound in Connecticut. And we uh, we spent a ton of time pursuing uh, these migratory fish that migrate up and down the East Coast called striped bass. That um, And we would fish for them mostly at night. We would go out there and he had... Uh, he had taken kind of a scientific approach to it all. He kept track over many years of, uh, like, what certain times of year and what the moon was and what the tides were and where he would catch these fish. For example, like, maybe he would sit off the northeast corner of Kakini Island uh, at a certain tide, you know, during a certain moon in October and usually catch these big migratory bass that come to him. And they get big. I mean, wow. they can get up to... Uh, you know, we would commonly catch them up to 40, 50 pounds, but, Woof. you know, so the, the, there's been stripers netted in commercial fishing boats that were over 100 pounds. They're big fish <laughs> and really good eating fish. But um, I think what really helped influence was me is my father went far beyond just teaching me, like, how to fish and how to catch fish. He was very passionate about the wilds, and he taught me, you know, about sandpipers and horseshoe crabs and jellyfish and sea robins and scallops and mussels and lobsters and, and, and everything everything that made up the world of the striped bass. Um, and he would tie it all together for me and, and, of course, talk about the importance of clean, healthy estuaries and, and all that sort of stuff. And at the same time, you know, he would get really sad and tell me stories. He'd point out places where there's now, like, big, giant mansions along the East Coast, big oh. estates and golf courses, and he would tell mm. me how, when he was a kid, those were salt marshes. And... Uh, and estuaries, and it's where he used to fish and crab, and um, hmm. you know, and it had just dramatically changed uh, in front of his eyes, and um, which I can relate to now because I've been in Montana now for over 30 years and see the same kind of stuff. I mean, uh, yeah. when I first moved here, there's a um, I had permission to hunt on this ranch just outside of Missoula that that's now uh, Walmart and Costco and <laughs> Reserve oh. Street and all that, you know development um so you know he really taught me to to go beyond the fishing and really appreciate what sustained these fish and um mm-hmm. and i guess through that i just developed a really strong connection to uh the environment to the wild so that kind of sums that up <laughs> i think i hope <laughs> yeah so it's also like a desire followed... to protect it all yeah you know because at the time well, that... also um Striped bass were also rapidly declining 
at that time because of uh, PCBs and other chemical pollutions that were in their um, spawning grounds like the Chesapeake Bay and the Hudson Bay and other places like that. So I learned a lot about that. And he, he traveled up and down the New England coast um, attending meetings and, and fighting to try to you know, protect the striped bass that meant so much to him. So well, what you know, an I got a lot from him, obviously. <laughs> he was a, good, a yeah. good man. He passed away about, oh, it's been about probably 16, 17 years, but, um, and I miss him every day. David, you were handpicked to be a member of the Marine Corps' Elite Force Recon Unit, chosen for your ability to conduct reconnaissance in harsh terrain and climates. You later wrote that this experience shaped your approach to hunting elk. How? Yeah. And by the way, I should add, my dad was not happy when I followed in his footsteps in the Marine Corps part because, you know, he had <laughs> been through some horrific battles and wars, and he, he never talked about those things. And uh, so he was very concerned when I joined. He, he did not like that idea. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, particularly when I got into Force Recon, uh, my mom later told me years later that when he learned that, uh, it's one of the only times she really saw him break down crying. So, oh. you know, but yeah, it did have a big influence on me in, I guess, in several ways. I'd say two ways. One is it, it shaped the way I hunted. I, when I first moved to Montana, I didn't know much about elk. I studied them like crazy. I, I read Jack Ward Thomas's Elk of North America, Ecology and Management, right. like it was, uh, friends used to tease me. It was like my Bible study. I'd get up every morning and read chapters of that. And I spent a lot of time in the mountains, and I was doing field work for the Forest Service. And uh, I worked four 10-hour days, so I'd have three days off a week that I'd just throw on my backpack and head out into the wilds and roam. And, um, mm. you know, I just tried to learn everything I could, not only about the elk, but their their habitat and what sustained them. And um, I think the first year I hunted, I ended up like 10 pretty rugged off-trail miles away from my camp when it got dark on me. And I had a heck of a time. I think I spent almost the whole night trying to get back to my camp in the middle of the night, bushwhacking through that country. And I thought, well, this is silly. I should hunt like, I, like we ran patrols in Force Recon, which was our motto was travel light, freeze at night. We were very, really... Um, <laughs> Okay. You know, we would just go on these patrols where we just had light. You know, we'd travel in three to four man teams to gather information and do reconnaissance mm -hmm. missions behind enemy territory. Oh. So we traveled light and we would carry these poncho liners. And um, when, it, when it got time to hold up, and we usually moved at night and hold up during the day to avoid detection from the enemy. And so we would. Um, one person would stay on watch, and the other two or three people would kind of huddle up, and we'd throw off four ponchos and poncho liners on top of us to stay warm. So I took off, decided to hunt elk with just a light little pack with a poncho and poncho liner. And, of course, without those other bodies helping keep you warm, it didn't work so well. I, I remember spending an incredibly cold night. It snowed, and it was windy, and it was cold, and I was trying to sleep under a little poncho poncho liner. But I eventually did kind of develop a technique where I'd – um, a real light but good down winter sleeping bag and then a poncho for that I could use as a shelter but also to put meat on and real minimal I'd keep it at less than 10 pounds and I would hunt with that pack on my back and I still do this and uh, in the fall and I follow the elk and um, wherever I am when it gets dark I just sleep there. Um, I huh. climb in my bag and throw the poncho over me if I have to, or set up a shelter, you know, maybe climb under a thick spruce tree or subalpin fir to help provide a little shelter. Um, I never build a fire and I don't cook food because I don't want to, I'm usually sleeping close to the elk. I can often hear them bugling at night, moving. And, uh, wow. So I try to keep really quiet and I try to not add extra scent to, you know, alert them to my presence. So I don't cook or anything. I just eat like uh, I'll carry a, maybe like an energy bar and a little bit of jerky. And I just drink out of the creeks and streams so I don't have to carry any extra weight. Um, huh. You know, and it turned out to be a really effective way to hunt. Um, this is all during bow season, mostly. Oh, yeah. And, you know, over uh, the last 32 years, I've, you know, I've killed close to 30 elk doing this with my bow. Wow. Um, 
So it became a very proficient, good way to hunt. <laughs> yeah. But, um, the other thing, and this gets a little odder, a little more difficult to explain, but I think the other thing that the influence that the military had on me when I look at hunting and what other hunters do, um, I think the best way to describe it is I can remember um, when I was a sergeant in Force Recon and on a recon mission, and we set up this observation post to observe for any enemy, any mean movement down in this like canyon and valley. And you know, and I had a lot of at that time that was in the '80s, early '80s, all during the Reagan years. And for then, it was all very state-of-the-art technology we had to help us do our jobs. We had, like, PBS-5 night vision goggles, satellite communications wow. gear, uh, remote sensors to detect movement around our perimeter, global positioning systems, um, you know, so we could determine precise locations of enemy movement and that kind of stuff, high-powered variable scopes on uh, M47.62 millimeter sniper rifles that, wow. you know, I had a... I went through sniper school, and, you know, I could hit a grapefruit at 1,000 meters. Um, so pretty high-tech stuff. You know, our motto was swift, silent, and deadly. And, you know, we use these skills and this technology, you know, against, like, the Qaddafis of the world. <laughs> so, well, yeah. I remember once I joked with one of my buddies. He was from Mississippi. And I said, uh, I was just kidding. And I said, man, could you imagine if we could use this stuff for hunting? Well, today you can. You look at a hunting catalog, look at Cabela's catalog or any hunting catalog or walk into a hunting huh. store. All this stuff is on sale. Um, huh. You know, I've joked with friends, use Cold War technology to hunt and kill elk. They're, you know, not too long ago I read about these people in Idaho that were using rifles similar to our sniper rifles to shoot elk at like 1,000 yards from across the canyon. And, uh, you know, it's literally, to steal a word from the Humane Society, it's a war on wildlife is what it feels like. You, you know, yeah. all the camouflage, all the high-tech gear, people hunting with AR-15s, um, using night vision scopes, using feeding stations, using uh, GPS units for their location, using, you know. Uh, right. <laughs> and, you know, so, so I think my experience started making me realize, too, that, you know, this – this really violates the concepts of fair chase, and it's really um, makes pretty unfair advantage when you have this kind of technology you're using on these animals that you know, you know evolved with the kind of predation of a grizzly bear or a mountain lion or maybe a Native American with a bow. Not <laughs> right. not all this high tech stuff we got today and the ATVs and four wheel drives, and, um, but it's all commonly accepted in the hunting world. I'm probably getting ahead of myself on that part, but that's, that was kind of another thing that I think my experience in the Marine Corps really made me take a look at hunting and see too many similarities that uh, aren't right. You know? Well, speaking of fair chase and technology, um, David, you've called yourself a Leopoldian, um, named for the great uh, conservation writer, hunter, and scientist Aldo Leopold. Why? Well, it's kind of funny how that came about. I have a good friend that you might have heard of, Jim Poswitz. He uh -huh. lives in Helena, Montana. He retired from Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Um, and he's kind of uh, the guru of fair chase hunting. You know, he wrote Beyond Fair Chase, The Ethics and Tradition of Hunting, and some other books. I had the honor of writing an introduction to one of his books. Um, he's kind of like a father to me. He's just this great guy and a very intelligent guy and a great philosopher and very Leopoldian in his own right very influenced by Aldo Leopold. Um, and I remember one day, and I was probably, I'm 58 now, and I was probably only 30 years old. <laughs> and, I, mm. and even then, I was frustrated with the hunting world. And I was having a beer with Jim and Helena, and I looked at him and I said, uh, you know, I just don't get it. I don't feel like I fit in with these people. I, <laughs> I'm a hunter, but I don't yeah. feel like I fit in with the hunters. And he looked at me like this was a great secret. He, he kind of has a good sense of humor, too, and he kind of looked around to make sure nobody was listening. And he leaned over and said to me, you know, he said, you know why, Dave? Because we're Leopoldians, and there's not many of us around. <laughs> and he, he right. said it a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but, um, but he's right. And yeah. it, so ever since that time, I've used the word Leopoldian to describe it. Uh -huh. And um, and I 
think he's right. I don't think there's a lot of hunters. You know, it's funny. Most hunters will quote Aldo Leopold and talk about Aldo Leopold while hypocritically doing all these things that go against what Aldo Leopold said. Mm-hmm. It's so funny to me to hear hunters quoting Aldo Leopold and then they'll bash wolves and make up lies and misconceptions about wolves and say they're eating all our elk and they'll use all this high tech gear and they, you know, all these things Aldo Leopold wrote against and spoke against <laughs> these people. Yeah. Uh, we'll do well, all also, quoting Leopold. Yeah, but but also yeah. Leopold too had kind of an epiphany. Had a number of them, but one of them involved predators. Uh, having been a predator control uh, federal agent, he changed his mind. Maybe you could share what that kind of transition and epiphany may mean to you. Well, that's something you probably know more than me about. I actually recently read a great essay you wrote about that on the Grizzly Times. But, um, well, yeah, you know, Leopold, if you follow all this works from Round River up to Sand County Almanac, I mean, he changed so much over his life and his views changed. That's one of the things I really admired and respected about him, that he was, you know, he wasn't set in his ways. He was willing and able to look at things and change his views in accordance with what we know about wildlife and science. And he... uh, you know, his famous essays, and I'm going off the top of my head, but Escadilla and uh, Thinking Like a Mountain and uh, yeah. other essays where he really started questioning the way we were treating predators, that they were an important part of the landscape and the ecosystems, and they were critical, and that they helped, uh, you know, the way I look at everything I love about a wild elk, their uh, wariness, their... Um, their behavior, their their speed, their everything, and you know everything I love about elk was shaped by their coevolution with predators like wolves and grizzlies and mountain lions, and uh, you know it's all connected. And yeah. you know Leopold started seeing that, and he became uh, you know he was pretty critical, pretty critical of hunting by the time he got uh, older, by the time he finished San County Almanac, mm-hmm. and. Um, You know, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but <laughs> yeah. he, uh, you know, I know you and I recently had a talk about whether or not he would have, uh, I often tell people I'm an anti-hunter who hunts. Yeah. Um, yeah. I kind of mean it a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but there's some truth to it. I mean, I, uh, I, I hunt, and I like to eat elk, and I got a freezer full of elk and deer, but... I just don't fit in with hunters, you know, all the technology and the ATVs and the industry and the, and the hunting shows and what all these people promote and do and the mm-hmm. ties to the NRA. And I, I just don't fit in. And, um, yeah, I feel like, and you know, it could be my own bias, but I feel like Leopold headed in the same direction. In fact, yeah. I have a quote right here near my desk. Okay. If you don't mind though. No, I actually keep, I keep it near my desk because it sums up, my views, and it's something Alda Leopold wrote, you know, right near the end of his life when he wrote Sand County Almanac, which, if I recall, he died uh, fighting a fire before he that was even published. Yeah. I think 1949? Yeah. And here's what he wrote. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so here's, here's what he wrote about this. I have the impression that the American sportsman is puzzled. He doesn't understand what is happening to him. Bigger and better gadgets are good for industry, so why not for outdoor recreation? It has not dawned on him that outdoor recreations are essentially primitive, atavistic, that their value is a contrast value, that excessive mechanization destroys contrast by moving the factory to the woods or to the marsh. The sportsman has no leaders to tell him what is wrong. The sporting Mm -hmm. press no longer represents sport. It has turned billboard for the gadgeteer. Wildlife administrators are too busy producing something to shoot at to worry much about cultural value of the shooting. Because everybody from Xenophon to Teddy Roosevelt has said sport has value, it is assumed that this value must be indestructible. And so, um, yeah. you know, he went on to explain that in further depth, but basically he was very concerned with where hunting was, was headed, mm-hmm. and particularly the technology uh, he was also very concerned, but because um, mostly it's hunting licenses and excise taxes on hunting equipment that funds a lot of the state fish and game agencies. Right. 
we also control those agencies. So those agencies start doing what we want. They, uh, you know, if we want more elk and want to get rid of the wolves because we think that'll create more elk for us to shoot, they do it. Um, <laughs> and it gets away from wildlife management more into animal husbandry, producing things to shoot at. And, you know, I know Leopold was very concerned about that. He even, uh, I think in one of the game conferences, he wrote a paper where he really criticized, for example, killing native predators to mm -hmm. sustain uh, populations of pheasants, which aren't even indigenous to this continent, you know. And right. he was very critical of that. So I, I feel like, uh, you know, when I question these things, I, I read Leopold, and I feel like I'm in good company anyway. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, but it makes sense because his writings have had a huge influence on me. Yeah. Well, but um, so, David, tracking the arc that Leopold articulated uh, into the present uh, in the terms perhaps of your own personal career, maybe you can talk about your journey a bit. Um, I, and I think it was when we first started talking decades ago, you were working as the communication specialist for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and you were actively promoting uh, preparedness by hunters and respect for grizzly bears uh, and getting ready to be in the company uh, of grizzly bears in the fall. But since then, the foundation has become really aggressively anti-carnivore, and so has the Montana Wildlife Federation, where you also worked. What has happened in your view, and what does this oh, boy. say to you? Yeah, that's an interesting, um, I don't know. You know, well, first of all, I was the conservation editor of the Bugle magazine, which was uh, uh, the magazine that the Rocky Mountain Elk, Elk Foundation produces. And for years, I loved the job because uh, when the Elk Foundation started and took off, it, you know, I'm going to go back to the term Leopoldian. It really had a Leopoldian kind of attitude and had a lot of Leopoldians sort of uh, involved. You know, people like uh, Jack Ward Thomas, who's a former chief of the mm -hmm. U.S. Forest Service, uh, Jack Lyon, Gary Wolf, uh, oh, yeah. uh, Bill Gear. you know, I'd add to that, uh, Alan Christensen. These were people that really were willing to, like Leopold, look at what might be wrong with hunting and how we can improve hunting and how we can help educate and inform people. And I love that because that was a big part of my job was to try to, through my conservation writing and editing with the Bugle magazine, to try to educate and inform the public. And um, Grizzlies was part of it, but I think what really led to a lot of problems was we ran a lot of articles about wolves and wolf mm. and elk interaction. Mm -hmm. And um, ironically, a lot of it was based at the time of, of studies that the Elk Foundation helped fund that <laughs> showed the relationship between elks and wolves and that the wolves really weren't having a big impact. And... Um, you know, I don't want to get into the details and bore you with it all, but, like, for example, up in Canada, they did a study where they found that um, wolf predation was more what they call uh, compensatory instead of additive. In, in other words, you know, the elk that the wolves were killing, um, the same number of elk may have died from a harsh winter, for example, if the wolves weren't in the, in the picture there. Mm -hmm. um, and that started creating a lot of stink because... There was a lot of tension in those days that was growing um, within the Elk Foundation of a lot of membership who didn't like hearing that kind of thing. They wanted to hate wolves. They wanted to believe the mis misconceptions and lies about wolves. You know, some of them, including the, they're not the same species that historically lived here. These are like some big right. uh, Frankenstein-like created evil species that are bigger <laughs> and kill more. You know, it's just, you know, the kind of stuff that's absolutely ridiculous and easily refuted by science. Mm -hmm. But it didn't matter. So there was a lot of pressure on us at the time to stop publishing these kind of articles. And another example I can give you was, uh, and this will help explain some more things later, um, you know, the ATV industry, for example. Uh, um. I, wrote, I wrote a lot of articles on um, the impacts that increased technology, and particularly the use of ATVs, was having on elk and other wildlife, um, increasing their vulnerability, opening access, erosion, um, you know, the noise, uh, the open roads were 
uh, meaning elk were moving further in the backcountry and not using servant habitat, what biologists call habitat effectiveness, was declining. Um, mm -hmm. It was making elk more vulnerable to hunters. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and on and on and on with that kind of stuff. But at the same time, the Elk Foundation was seeking to get money and funding from the hunting industry, including like the ATV industry. So they weren't very happy. <laughs> they wanted to run ads in our magazine, but they weren't yeah. going to do it if we were bashing the industry. So those were the kind of pressures we were facing. And it finally, in a nutshell, led to sort of an overthrow of the Elk Foundation back in the day. Um, everybody came into work one morning, and I think everybody sort of jokingly called it a Black Monday, but uh, hmm. most of the leaders had received notices that they were you know, fired or could – or they could reapply for their jobs if they wanted to, which was kind of a <laughs> business-like way of firing them. And they put a businessman at the time in charge. Um, it was basically, it was kind of a hostile takeover by the board of directors, which had become really conservative. Uh, I mean, to the point of ridiculous, they had a board director at the time who was mad because we ran this great article by a, a writer who's a friend of mine named Dave Peterson that lives down in Colorado. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great guy, great thinker, great writer. He's had a mm -hmm. big influence on me. We, he published this kind of fun philosophical essay about if Karl Marx had ever sat down and had a conversation, I think, with – oh, my God, I could be wrong here, but I think it was with, like, either Theodore Roosevelt or Aldo Leopold, because you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. apparently they were hunters. And it was kind of a mm -hmm. fun philosophical essay. And at the time uh, – it was the first Gulf War we had sent troops into uh, Iraq. Mm -hmm. And one of the board directors was so angry about the article, and he said, we can't be running an article that celebrates a communist while we're fighting communists in Iraq, which was just <laughs> absolutely bizarre. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Iraq isn't communist. This wasn't I mean, so oh you know, they wanted the whole bugle staff fired. Um, Another quick example, and I could go on and on, but I wrote an article mm -hmm. that talked about the wounding rate among bow hunting. There was a lot of oh, research yeah. that showed there was an unusually and sadly high wounding rate with bow hunters. Yeah. You know, taking crazy shots at elk with a bow and hitting them right. with arrows, and they were running off and... <laughs> and uh, Bleeding. So... The Pope and Young Club, which is uh, – they keep trophy records for bow hunting and, um, and the hunting industry and the bow hunting industry uh, were really angry about all this and demanded I be fired, and they wanted those articles kind of pushed out. And so what happened in the end is the Elk Foundation did radically change. They changed leadership. They wanted to appeal um, – to the massive amounts of hunters, so they quit educating and informing, and they started helping spread the lies. Um, they eventually hired a new executive director. His name was Dave Allen, and uh -huh. he quite literally would make statements like um, he called wolf reintroduction the worst ecological disaster in North America since the decimation of the bison. Uh. He said that wolves were devastating elk populations, that there'd be nothing left. He said uh, he perpetuated the myths about them being a uh, a different species, more evil and bigger. Yeah. He, right. And he went beyond that. And he even said, we need to get rid of the wolves, and then we need to go after the grizzlies. You know, this was oh. a new attitude. Um, right. So I quit. I wasn't one of the ones fired, but I left there because I couldn't work under that yeah. kind of atmosphere. And I ended up writing some essays about it. Um, mm. I had developed an award for the Elk Foundation called the Olas J. Murray Award, named after Olas Murray, who's kind yeah. of considered the father of modern elk management, mm -hmm. um, and was another great thinker, philosopher, very Alba Leopoldian-like guy. Um, in fact, yeah. I think he influenced Alba Leopold. Yeah, they were, came they were friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Olas Murray was, a, you know, another guy who had his writings had a tremendous influence on me. So we developed an award named for Olas Murray. Well, years later, after I left, the Elk Foundation got so uh, bad that Olas J. Murray's family contacted the Elk Foundation and said they, their request was that they no longer use his name. They didn't even want Olas Murray's name associated with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, the guy who's considered the father of modern elk management. <laughs> and so they did stop using it. Uh-huh. Uh 
And interestingly enough, they ended up coming with another award that's named after Dale Earnhardt, a NASCAR driver. So, you know, that's how bizarre it gets. So anyways, in a nutshell, that, you know, I ended up writing an essay about that that was published uh, by Writers on the Range with High Country News, Betsy Marston. And, um, and that was sort of the beginning where I started getting really shunned by the hunting community. Uh, I could no longer write for their magazines and nobody wanted to print my stuff. And, you know, if you're, it's a very cliquish group of people and if you start questioning things you know you're 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 shunned you're cast away from the family you're not part of them anymore um and so that happened more and more that's now I'm very kind of tribal rambling, yeah well let's get into grizzly bears a bit david uh you've mentioned them already but and they're obviously in your writings and your thinking very important to you maybe you can explain your sort of relationship with the bear Oh, boy. <laughs> well, you know, when I got out of Force Recon, I was really struggling with a lot of things. And it's part of the reason I moved to Montana. I guess I moved here for a lot of reasons, but I wanted to kind of retreat into the what at the time I thought was truly big, wild country, at least a lot bigger and wilder than we have back east. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted to go to school here at the University of Montana. and uh, But I was struggling with a lot of things, like a lot of veterans do when they get out. And... Um, Mostly I wanted to just spend a lot of time in the wild. And when I started doing that, I had some interesting and spooky encounters with grizzly bears. <laughs> <You know>? um, <laughs> they always bring to mind, uh, uh, um, I'm going to paraphrase here, but uh, um, oh, I can't even think of his name right now. The, the writer, uh, Bill, Bill Kittredge, William Kittredge oh, once yeah. wrote something. Uh, we need grizzlies around. If nothing else, they teach us a little humility. But um, right. I just found it absolutely fascinating that you could roam the wild here and um, and see these animals that could, under the right circumstances, not only kill you, but perhaps consume you, you know? <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, <laughs> right. you're, not, you're not the top of the food chain out there when you're, when you're roaming the wilds with, you know, <laughs> without a, a <laughs> M16, you know? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> no kidding. But it's funny, that, that really started changing. And the more time I spent around them and the more encounters I had and the more I saw them, um, that fear turned more into admiration and respect and, um, and that sort of thing. And then about that time, I moved here in 1986. And I think it was about 1990 that uh, Doug Peacock's book, Grizzly Years, was published. Right. It's mm -hmm. called, um, I have it right here, Grizzly Years, In Search of the American Wilderness, which, of course, is about his struggles, having been a, a, a Green Beret medic in Vietnam. Right. And the horrors he saw, which, you know, I can sort of relate, but I never saw any of the kind of brutal horrors he saw or experienced. But, you know, but I can still kind of relate to it a bit. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he came to Montana, and he kind of retreated to the wilds, and he spent a lot of time around grizzly bears. And they had a similar sort of influence on them. Um, and, you know, I won't even pretend to be at any level as Doug Peacock because he spent a ton of time oh. around him. And he, of course, fought for him and studied him and produced films. And uh, so, you know, but I really, really connected with that book in a very strong way. In fact, I read it once a year, and I have ever since. And uh, wow. huh. I've since met Doug and gotten to know him, and he's just, you know, he's one of my heroes. He's just an amazing mm -hmm. guy. Yeah. That and his connection to uh, Edward Abbey, who's also <laughs> one of my right, heroes. Um, right. You know, Doug being Hey Duke, but uh, right. Despite all that, and I, and I almost reluctant to say that to people because that that somehow portrays him as this fictitious character, which he's not. He's an amazing guy and uh, very knowledgeable, very passionate, and very connected to the Bears. And um, mm -hmm. so I think, in a way, through his writing, he helped me along with my journey. And, help me understand these animals, but then I came to relate to them, uh, um, you know, when I was going through my own personal struggles, mm -hmm. and one of the things I struggled with years ago was, uh, you know, I'm gay, and uh, accepting my own sexuality, and um, there was this time I was on a big, uh, crazy trip I took from uh, my front porch in Missoula to yeah. Alberta, Canada. Right. through some of the most wild and remote country left in the lower United States. And I, I did it mostly off trail by myself, bushwhacking 
and basically uh-huh. went from here to Canada, and it took me three months. Maybe wow. I'm guessing a thousand miles or so as the crow flies, as the raven goes, <laughs> yeah, know, right. up and down and around, and taking my time. Um, and I had some one interesting encounter in particular was uh, a grizzly bear, a grizzly sow with some cubs that I ended up uh, encountering. And they weren't aware of my presence. The wind was coming my direction. Uh-huh. And I laid down and stayed quiet behind this big log, and I just watched them for hours. And it was wow. just fascinating, you know. I'd see the cubs running over to the sow and trying to milk, but I think they were a little too old for that. And she'd kind of swat them with her paw, and they'd go rolling. <laughs> and then it was almost yeah. not to be too anthropomorphic, but then it would look like she was a bit regretful of that and then would go over and start licking them like, you know, <laughs> like maybe I was a little too rough, but, you know. Right. Uh, and I watched them for hours and I just remember thinking, you know, they are what they are. They're not evil. They're not some sacred mystical thing. They're, they're bears and they, they need right. space. They need uh, tolerance. They need understanding. They need um, respect. And I kind of related that to myself, how um. You know, gay people are often misunderstood and vilified, and yeah. um, particularly with Christian conservatives who say, you know, they're going to destroy family values. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I could go on, you know, I don't need to get too much detail on that, but uh, in a way I could just sort of relate that, um, you know, people hate what they misunderstand, mm-hmm. and people misunderstand grizzlies, and so a lot of people hate them and, uh, and fear them, mm-hmm. and... Um, it was just kind of a big moment in my life. It sort of changed the way I looked at the bears and looked at the wilds. And um, <laughs> since then, I've really dedicated myself to studying them more and learning more, more about them, which that's kind of how I stumbled onto you and Dave. Uh, you know, I've been a big yeah. fan of Dave's writings and the, uh, the Grizzly Times blogs is so informative to me. Um, oh, thank you. So much great information. And uh, I really appreciate the stuff you guys have put out. Well, it goes And since way. then, I've been, you know, easy. as you know, I've been trying to be as active as I can in writing in defense of grizzlies mm-hmm. and wild places and the most recent yeah, you battle, are... you know, get them back listed and stop the hunt and all that good sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, your work is so important. One grizzly bear project that was interesting to me when I came across it. I've remembered the uh, efforts to look for grizzly bears in Idaho's Selway Bitterroot ecosystem, which is this vast landscape where bears once were, but they've been extirpated more or less, or almost entirely. And in the early 2000s, you participated in something called the Great Grizzly Search to try to see if there were bears still left in that ecosystem. Um, and it sounds like it was quite the adventure. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what you looked for and what you found. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. That was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. I'm trying to remember some of the details, but um, basically, uh, you know, Chuck Jonko, who has since unfortunately passed away, but he was another uh, great inspiration to me, great bear biologist and activist and uh, fascinating guy. Um, at the time, you know, I guess let me back up here, too, that, you know, we have these, for the, for the audience, because I know you and <laughs> I've learned a lot of this from you and Dave, so <laughs> I'm repeating what I've learned. <laughs> but, you know, we've got these grizzly populations to the north, and we've got grizzly populations in the south. And one of the things that most biologists agree on is uh, for genetic health and viability and the long-term health of these bears, you know, those populations, we hope, are eventually connected. And one of the corridors that would really bring that together and connect them is the Selway Bitter Wilderness. You know, it's 1.3 million acres, one of the biggest wilderness areas in the lower 48 of the United States. And when you connect that to uh, the Frank Church River of No Return, and the only thing between the two is a dirt road, and that's another one and a half million or so acres, that's, that's a big chunk of wild country. And there's no doubt it could sustain grizzlies. So um, at the time, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had proposed reintroducing grizzlies into the Subway Bureau wilderness, but they had reached a compromise between the extractive industry and some environmental groups, like the National Wildlife Federation and some others, I think, uh, 
mm-hmm. to make it a uh, non-essential experimental population. Mm-hmm. In other words, they'd put mm-hmm. some grizzlies in there, but they wouldn't be fully protected under the Endangered Species Act. Um, there'd be a committee made up of various diverse people, and um, they could make decisions regarding the bears. If there was trouble, they could kill them. Well, other environmental groups, and like Chuck Jonkel's group, the Great Bear Foundation, and some of the others, didn't like that idea because they felt there were already grizzlies in the Southway Bear Wilderness. And if there were, that would mean they couldn't be an experimental, non-essential population, if that makes sense. So um, they were trying to prove there were grizzlies in there. And they called it the Great Grizzly Search. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things they were doing was um, they were doing these overflights of the wilderness in the springtime when bears were starting to come out of their dens hoping that they would see areas where, uh, in the high country, in the kind of habitats where grizzlies might den, um, where they might have popped out of the snow and headed out of the lower country. And they did end up indeed finding something like that, where they could see where, uh, um, from the air, and they took aerial photos, and you could see a bear had kind of popped up out of the snow, and mm-hmm. you could see tracks kind of heading down to the low country. And they thought, well, that could possibly be a grizzly. But the problem was, <laughs> uh, it was like... Well, I don't remember March or April, and the avalanche conditions were extreme, and the rivers were yeah. flooded with snowmelt, and um, it was a really dangerous time to go into there. And the way I understand it is a friend of mine was at a meeting, and they said, I don't think we'd get anybody to go in there. And um, my friend said, well, I know this crazy X-Force Recon Marine. He'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, that was an accurate description of me at the time. I'm a little older now, mm-hmm. but... Uh, when they told me about it, I jumped at the opportunity. I thought, this is an exciting adventure. So, yeah, I'll do it. And um, I ended up going with Larry Campbell, right? Um, who's an activist that lives in Darby yeah. and uh, was involved with Friends of the Bitterroots and other groups and um, also a great you know, wilderness adventure. And it was a good team. We really had a, a great time. We ended up uh, going on this amazing trip. We had to cross a pretty rough, flooded river and uh, – you know, work our way around some avalanche danger, and we snowshoed up into the high country, and we used the aerial photos to kind of locate. It had snowed quite a bit on our journey, mm. so the tracks and everything were covered up. But we were able to kind of use these aerial photos they had given us. To sort of, I felt like I was on a marine recon mission, you know, to find, <laughs> you know, there was like, for example, this old distinguished dead white bark pine, and you could see from the photos that it was just kind of northeast of there, maybe a couple hundred feet. And we, we ended up digging and digging and digging, and we finally found uh, – I compare it to this sort of uh, – like I've read about people who find these uh, gold veins that you know, kind of lead to the mother road. <laughs> well, we kind of found dirty snow where it was probably the tunnel where the spare climbed out. We kind of followed that in, digging with shovels, and we dig down, and uh, – we were getting closer and closer, and we finally kind of digged into the den. And I remember digging, and I remember Larry saying, whoa, Dave, is there any <laughs> chance that bear could, st- could have gone back in there? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and it reminded me of a – have you ever seen there's this Far Side cartoon where um, this bear is in a cave, and the bear is using these human skulls like puppets, and – She's talking to her cubs, and the cubs are – and she says something like, okay, one more time I'll tell the story, and then you have to get to bed. So I heard Jim <laughs> say, hey, <laughs> you think there's any bears in that den? <laughs> yeah, maybe you'd have to see it, but it was kind of funny, and it reminded me of that mm-hmm. cartoon, and we, uh, we kind of backed off and we thought it, and we decided, well, I'm going to keep digging, and um, Larry stood guard with a – can of bear spray ready <laughs> spray it just right. in case and we got in there unfortunately for us and the bear the bear was not there but right. oh I, I i had never been in a bear den before and i climbed in there and the smell the musk you could smell bear you could smell yeah. um, just an incredible experience and uh all this hoar frost hanging from the the ceiling of the den like a little small cave i climbed into um hmm. very dark and damp and uh musky smelling and and you can see where, like, the perspiration from the bear had reached the top of the cave and then, like, froze. And so there was some kind of ice hanging down. Wow. And there was a bed, like, made of bear grass. Um, yeah. Which I was told is kind of a, a, a sign of grizzlies. Um, that, that's mm-hmm. something they do. And black bears aren't as 
It's not as common to do all that. And of course, there was hair all over in there. So we gathered hair samples, and it took us a couple more days to get out of there, and we turned the hair samples over to Charles Jonkel. Mm -hmm. He sent them off to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And Charles felt like it could have been grizzly hair because it was like had little silver tips on the end, and they seemed, mm -hmm. you know, he said it quite possible, but hard to say. Well, the test came back inconclusive. Mm -hmm. So um, we never found out. And then I know Larry went back there a month or so later with Doug Peacock himself, and uh, uh -huh. they again found the dam, and they found more bear hair. And they sent that in, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service sent back and said the results were conclusive that it was a a brown-colored black bear. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a cynical side of me that wonders about the results since the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was doing the testing, yeah, and they right. wanted to go with the – I don't think they wanted right. us to prove there were grizzlies in there. But, you know, I don't know. No. You never know. It's hard to say. I've roamed the Selway Bitter Wilderness quite a bit over the last 30 years off trail all over that country. Um, yeah. And I've never seen any distinguishable grizzly tracks or anything. On the other hand, there's reports of them having been in there at the time. And more recently, of course, there have been confirmed sightings of grizzlies in the Bitterroot. Yeah. So hopefully they're moving in there. Um, yeah. Fact, I recently and there was one incident that. recently, the incident involving the grizzly bear in the Bitterroot Valley that got on the golf course and Fish and Wildlife Service yeah. seems to have panicked. Yeah, the Whitetail you know, Golf Course back. right there on the Lee Metcalf Wildlife Refuge, and they actually caught it in a trap. So yeah, that's as good proof as it gets. But um, so, but in a nutshell, what happened then was, uh, uh, if I recall, um, George W. Bush took office, um, and they put an end to any reintroduction of grizzlies. There was a lot of opposition to it, a lot of fear, a lot of people. Um, I don't know if you remember Helen Chenoweth. She was a congresswoman oh, from Idaho who insisted on being called a congressman. And mm -hmm. uh, she said something along the lines of, we don't need those killer, schizophrenic, manic-depressive animals in our wilderness. And um, right. you know, she was leading the battle to, to stop it. And there was a lot of mis lies and misconceptions and fear. And so the project came to an end, and there was no... Uh, Experimental reintroduction, no kind of reintroduction, and and now we're back to where we just kind of hope the bears get there on their own, and it seems like they may be doing that. When I talked about the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, you had also mentioned the Montana Wildlife Federation. And, yeah. Which, by the way, I, I served two terms as president of the organization, and then I worked for them on their staff. Um, they're Montana's largest and oldest you know, hunter and angler based conservation organization. They've done a lot of great work. You know, I don't think it's fair with them to say they were anti predator. They're not quite like the Elk Foundation. They don't spread the lies mm -hmm. and myths and misconceptions. They don't, um, right. you know, do that kind of stuff. However, one of the reasons I think it's worth coming back to is because it illustrates what part of what I think is wrong in the, in the hunting world. Even the best of hunting conservation groups, like the Montana Wildlife Federation and Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Um, mm -hmm. It's not fair to say they're anti-predator, but they avoid the topic. I mean, hunting groups have to appeal to the lowest common denominator, as Leopold put it. They have mm -hmm. to appeal to the masses of hunters if they want to, you know, have support and money. They have to appeal to the hunting industry. Um, and the people that go out and do hunting shows and, you know, and kill for amusement and profit. And um, so there's all these pressures. And... So they're not going to come out and say, oh, we shouldn't hunt grizzlies or wolves aren't bad because then they're going to lose a lot of their membership and they're going to be seen as green weenie tree huggers. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. And they're afraid of that. So I wouldn't say they're anti-predator, but they avoid and evade the issue. They don't want to upset their mm -hmm. membership. So they right. will agree to certain things. You know, like I know they support the grizzly hunt despite, you know, all the scientific evidence that shows it's not a good way to – try to manage grizzlies. Um, mm -hmm. But they support it because they're not mm -hmm. going to go upset their membership. And so uh, I wanted to clarify that. You mm -hmm. know, overall, I think they're a good organization that does a lot of great work, yeah. but with a lot of good people. Right. But, uh, do, do you see uh, in the hunting community um, people like yourself Oh, and Jim Posowitz, um, young people who are saying, wait a minute, maybe we do need to speak up for these 
um, large carnivores. Oh, yes, I do. And, and when I have essays published on this stuff, you know, I talked about how I'll often get hammered by the hunting community and kind of shunned, but I will often get um, a lot of letters of support from other hunters who feel the same. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it's kind of like a lot of them will be, you know, but they won't speak out about it because they right. don't want to have the same kind of repercussions. I mean, you know, there's repercussions to speaking out about these things. <laughs> it not only gets you shunned, but it's hard to find work you know, <laughs> when you're in that yeah. kind of profession. Um, yeah. And it's easy. You know, I can't – it's amazing how many times a, a week I'm accused of being a anti-hunter, green weenie, tree hugger who must be a city guy who doesn't understand wildlife. That's, you know, that's right. their common defenses. <laughs> Get out of New York City, right. <laughs> oh, exactly. Oh, it's, it's funny, too, because I think of you and Dave often, of course, Dave being this, you know, incredibly experienced wildlife biologist that spent so much time among grizzlies and in the wild. But whenever I see anybody write something that's factual and truthful about, say, wolves or grizzlies, you'll see hunters on these social media posts saying, well, they're from the city. They don't get and understand wildlife. I'm like, well, you know, you haven't met Louise or Dave Madsen or Doug Peacock or <laughs> right. locals who live here in Montana and actually know what they're talking about. But it's just, yeah. you know, it's an easy way to dismiss others' arguments. You just say, uh, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. They're from the city. They're anti-hunting. They, you know, then you get these incredibly paranoid schemes. Like they're just, uh, they want the wolves and grizzlies to eat all the elk so there's no more hunting because they're anti-hunters. <laughs> That's one oh, of my favorites I see quite often. That's bizarre, huh? It's 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 a bizarre world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. And the hunting groups but, go along with it, you know. David, maybe you could share about your son. What kind of world do you hope he inherits, and are you optimistic for him and his generation? Oh boy. <laughs> well, there's two parts to that answer. Um, my son, unfortunately, has a. Uh, genetically inherited disease called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, basically, his DNA doesn't produce dystrophin, which nourishes muscles. So it's a sort of slow progressive disease in which his muscles decline. It started with his leg muscles and eventually, uh, you know, as he gets older, it'll eventually affect his heart and lung muscles and his life expectancy is oh. that long. Um, oh. However, there is a lot of hope. Um, he's on special steroid-based medications that slows the progression of the disease. Um, and there's also a lot of clinical trials underway that offer a lot of hope and promise for finding potential cures and treatments. And, uh, and he's a wonderful, happy kid. Uh, he still walks a bit, but he's in a wheelchair part-time. And I get him out as much as I can into the wilds, and we do a lot of fishing and canoeing. Um, but as far as the other part, uh, you know, I alternate. There's days I'm just very uh, cynical, and, and I don't feel like there is much hope. I mean, we've just um, massive amounts of human population on this planet growing every day, <laughs> consuming mass resources, yeah. um, people more and more disconnected from the, the natural world that sustains us. Um, you know, then not even getting into climate change. We're completely altering the Earth's climate and creating all this mess. Um, so it's hard to be hopeful. I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of hope that, that people in the future will be ex able to experience truly wild country like some of us have in the past. Um, you know, on the other hand, there is there's a growing awareness to it. Um, you know, we've talked about this. I, I help coach a speech and debate team at the high school here in Missoula. And I, I, I feel real hopeful sometimes when I hear these incredibly uh, – intelligent and talented young men and women being able to uh, talk about a lot of complex topics in a very uh, factual, intelligent way. And um, that kind of gives me hope that, you know, maybe the younger generation will finally uh, start, start having debates and discussions uh, based on fact and truth, which doesn't seem to count nowadays anymore in our current <laughs> situation, and, uh, and finding good, viable solutions. I mean um, – you know, every now and then when I do hear about a lot of communities are embracing uh, more efficient ways of using energy and alternative and renewable sources of energy, uh, that gives me hope. Um, so I try, I guess in a nutshell, I try to be hopeful. It depends on my days. I have good days and bad days. Other days I look at the news and it's just very depressing and uh, not real hopeful. So 
Let's hope the uh, younger generation is smarter and better than we were <laughs> overall. So I hope so, too. Um, well, thank you very we much. we sure left them a mess. <laughs> we have, but there, there are some bright ones coming up. Well, I so oh, appreciate yeah. you taking the time, David, and um, well, so you're listening you. to Grizzly Times and uh, with David Stalling.